welcome to the Lock Carroll County Historical Museum. My name is Rachel Crow and I am the Outreach Education Coordinator. Please come on in. Let me be your tour guide. Have you heard of WCTU of America? If not, let's find out. Following the American Revolutionary War, alcohol-related problems were on the rise and people were looking for solutions. Alcoholism seemed to go hand in hand with spousal abuse, family neglect, and chronic unemployment. One solution, referred to as temperance, began in the early 1800s as a movement to limit drinking in the United States. Many city residents in America resented the scores of saloons in their communities that enticed working men to squander their money on alcohol and gambling. In the early days of the temperance movement, the solution to alcohol-related problems was thought to be drink in moderation rather than abstinence. The temperance movement grew through the, throughout the country establishing temperance societies. After the Civil War, around 1865, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, or WCTU, formed and grew alongside the suffrage movement. This union was officially founded in November of 1874 in Cleveland, Ohio, in response to a series of temperance demonstrations that were re occurring throughout New York and in much of the Midwest beginning in 1873. The organization trained women in leadership, public speaking, and political thinking. The Helping Hand Union of the Women's Christian Union was organized in Madison at a meeting presided over by Mrs. Brunn of Chicago on April 18, 1898. It started with a charter membership of nine, and by 1916, this group had 35 active members. Well-attended meetings were held once a month. This union focused on press work, Sunday school, purity, anti-narcotics, had a young people's branch, and more. Each area had a superintendent whose duty was to plan the work for each area. In 1916, this union had become one of the most active and progressive organizations for the good in the community. By 1920, the Madison chapter had grown to 52 members with Mrs. Anna Dale serving as president. Some of the topics of study for that year were prison reform, world prohibition, public health, moral education, legislation, and anti-narcotics. Some of the members that year were Maria Tullefson, great-grandmother of Kevin Bill and John Tullefson of the Madison-Dawson area, Mrs. Eleanor Borgendale, a 30-year former librarian at the Madison Carnegie Library, and Mrs. Carrie Bly, the grandmother of poet Robert Bly. There was a Women's Christian Temperance Union in Madison in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. This organization supported a reading room by having lawn socials, teas, and bazaars. As the temperance movement waged on, advocates became more extreme, none more so than Carrie Nation, a six-foot-tall, strong, and formidable woman. Her first husband, a doctor in the Union Army, was an alcoholic. They married in 1867 and had a daughter before separating due to his alcoholism. After his death in 1869, Carey developed a passion to fight against alcohol consumption. In 1874, she married David Nation, and by 1889, they settled in Medicine Lodge, Kansas, where David began preaching. Sometimes Carey wrote his sermons, which would include attacks on smoking, drinking, and other sins. Carey became involved with the local WCTU chapter. At this time, Kansas was a dry state, but as the law was generally not enforced, Carey believed that something should be done. Medicine Lodge is also where Carey started a branch of the Women's Christian Temperance Union and campaigned for the enforcement of Kansas's ban on the sale of liquor. Some of her fellow reformers were using speeches, sermons, and literature to convince people not to drink. 
In 1900, Carrie began to walk into saloons and cause a commotion, doing simple protests and or sing songs to the patrons. In June of 1900, Carrie awoke from a dream in which God suggested that she go to Kiowa, Kansas and break down a saloon. She did just that, smashing mirrors and bottles under them, opening kegs of beers, and throwing slot machines. Carrie Nation continued to destroy saloons in Kansas for the next 10 years using axes, hammers, and rocks to attack bars and pharmacies. She quickly became known as a saloon smasher. Her husband joked that she should use a hatchet for maximum damage. As a result, she had hatchet pins made, which she sold. The sale from these paid her jail fines. Her actions were designed to be as shocking and attention-getting as possible, and the attacks were called hatchetations. She was arrested 30 times from 1900 to 1910. The actions of Cary Nation were covered frequently in the Dawson Sentinel and the Western Guard. Cary's crusade against drinking alcohol contributed to the passing of the 18th Amendment. There were many articles about saloons, liquor licenses, and temperance in the Guard and Sentinel. Here is a partial article from the Dawson Sentinel, um, written February 15, 1901. The blind pig, and blind pigs were establishments that sold beer illegally, situation in Dawson had become so loud that the ladies of town, inspired by the successful efforts of Mrs. Nation, have taken matters in their own hands and served notice on the blind piggers, hotel keepers, and druggists to discontinue their illegitimate practice or ruin would follow. Monday evening, a large group of ladies visited the hotel and drug stores and served notice upon the proprietors that unless the sale of liquors was stopped in their establishments, the methods employed by Mrs. Nation would be visited upon them. An article from the Dawson Sentinel called The License Question was written also on February 15th of 1901. Citizens of Dawson are wondering whether or not the sale of intoxicating liquors will be licensed in the upcoming year. The citizens are contemplating if the sale of liquor will be less if establishments must obtain a license. Some residents believe that the sale of liquor will be less if establishments must obtain a license. For there to be reform in the use of alcohol, people need to be educated on its effects. If people were educated to let it alone, there would be no liquor sales. There is a concern about the ease of which minors can obtain alcohol. It would be better if alcohol would only be sold in saloons. This would help to prevent minors' access to alcohol as they are not allowed in saloons. It is felt that the money spent in saloons could be better spent in the necessities and luxuries for life for a man and his family. The Sentinel is convinced that from a practical standpoint, the best interest of the village and its citizens, both morally and financially, will be served by voting for license this coming year. An article from the Dawson Sentinel on March 22, 1901. We are sorry that the streets of Dawson will again be polluted by saloon signs and half-drunken crowds around the saloon doors. The only thing that we can do now is to trust that our men and young men, especially, are too manly to blot their character and reputation by frequenting a place like a saloon. You are not only paying the saloon keeper your money, but you are jeopardizing everything that is honorable within you. You know that public opinion, especially among women, is against the man who drinks. Hence, you must be conscious that you are losing the respect of your fellow man. If you lose your self-respect, there is very little left to make a man. If you are interested in more Lackaparo County history, check out the Lackaparo County Museum, located in Madison, Minnesota. Thank you.